Welcome back to Everard Junction. In today's video we're going to be covering some weathering. Weathering is something I haven't done for a few months on the channel, so I thought it'd be nice to bring you along for the ride with regards to weathering this Type 4 locomotive, better known as the Class 47. This particular model is the latest Class 47 tooling from Backman, and very nice it is too. There's a few things that differ on the new model over the old model with regards to taking it apart and how it works and things like that. So you'll see some of that during the course of this video when we take this thing to bits. But the main focus will be doing the weathering treatment, providing a realistic level of sort of dirt and grime without spoiling the lovely livery and paint finish that we have on this particular locomotive. This is a 47.8 subclass, which represents one of the later conversions to the fleet of class 47s and could be seen throughout the 80s, 90s and early 2000s running long distance passenger trains hauling these air conditioned Mark II coaches that you can see behind it. Before and during a weathering project I always consult actual photographs of the real thing and uh, I've been poring over various photos of class 47s during the late 1980s and early 1990s. This photograph is a very good example of what I'm going to be going for with this project. Here we have 47826 and this was taken at Bristol in 1993 and uh, you can see the loco is quite clean. We've got little bits of ingrained dirt around the head code box, the high intensity headlight, the cab doors and a few other small areas but mostly it's quite clean. The underframe is your usual level of class 47 dirt and grime with grease present on the buffers and on this particular example you can see the fuel tank appears to have been overfilled or there's some sort of leak because you can see that sort of glossy sheen on that tank uh, at the bottom of the locomotive. There's your usual bit of soot and grime on the roof but nothing too serious and you can see the window those are also very clean so uh, this loco is being looked after and the drivers are taking time to uh, clean the windows um, each day when it goes out into service. That's quite typical for the 47.8 subclass that started to appear in the late 80s and the early 90s. They all got a fresh coat of paint and a nice overhaul so certainly during the time period I'm modelling they would have looked quite presentable as you can see by this photograph. So that's what we're going to try and stick to and uh, we'll see how we get on. I've run this Class 47 for a couple of hours now and it seems to be absolutely fine, no issues to report. So I'm going to go ahead and commit to doing some weathering and uh, personalising it a little bit for the layout. I'll also add a driver. These new 47s don't come with a driver anymore. That was something the old model used to come with and personally I also thought that was quite good. Even if he wasn't particularly well painted, it always looked better with a figure in the cab. I'll also fit all of the detailing accessories to the front of the model and one of the new features of this model over the old one is the NEM socket which uh, you use to connect up a coupling can now be removed. It was previously part of the bogey but they've changed that. So I'll get rid of that as it's an unsightly bit of detail sticking out the front of the engine. At the other end I will leave it as is because obviously we need a coupler at that end to connect to the train that it's pulling first thing I'll do is remove the body shell from the model. I like to treat the body separately to the chassis. Removing the body shell is very similar to the old model. There is a screw at the centre front of the model, right up there, and then there are two screws in recessed holes. Oh, okay, that's new. So the wires going to the cab lights are connected through two little plugs it looks like here on the circuit board so just very gently uh, take those out you should be able to put the body to one side. A little bit tricky to disconnect those just used a small uh, pair of tweezers uh, once they do finally release from the socket there is a bit of uh, movement so just be mindful of that try and uh, avoid scratching the body. Interesting just comparing the two chassis new model on the left older tooling on the right Obviously the electronics is a bit more modernised, there's greater use of surface mount LEDs, things like that. Uh, there's also uh, more uh, metal in the chassis of this one, it's been used to a greater extent and put in more places. For example the leading edge of the bogey there, you can see that's a bit of metal in there. So yeah, they've added a few extra grams here and there to try and get the weight up so it can pull more stuff. Although this chassis is perfectly all right really in terms of weight. Uh, the main thing is the, the gearbox, the motor and things like that. Superior in the newer model I must say. These ones good but uh, occasionally you do get one that's uh, quite a noisy runner and sometimes they have a tendency to wobble. 
certainly on the new one so far it seems uh, much much better. So now I'm going to remove the bogey frames. Uh, this just makes painting the wheels quite a lot easier. I'll also take out this uh, NEM coupling pocket as we don't need that and it will spoil the front end appearance of the model once it's got all the details fitted. And uh, previously these were held on with uh, clips. There's a clip here and a clip here and the whole frame used to just come off. It looks like that's still the case but there's now two extra screws. I'm not sure what they do so I'll take those out as a precaution and try and uh, prise the bogey frame from the clips. This was always a bit of a bugger on the old model so let's see if this one's any easier. Basically I take a very very small screwdriver, try and put it underneath the bogey like so and push it in between the bogey and the bogey frame and hopefully prise that clip loose but they can be a bit stubborn well there we go hopefully I didn't break it oh, that looks like we're okay looking at the gearbox you can see some of the changes for the new model we have more substantial axle bearings than the previous model and this uh, gear train or bogey tower um, is now die cast. It's made of mazak as opposed to the previous model which was made of plastic. So before I go any further I'm going to go ahead and fit all of the little bits of detail that come in the extra bag of goodies with the model. There are certain bits that I won't be fitting because I want to keep a coupler at one end of the locomotive but certainly there are a number of bits and pieces here that I can fit to the model to enhance its appearance and if I fit those now when I go ahead and do the weathering all of those bits will get painted as well. So I'll be fitting coupling detail to one end, air hose detail to one end, ETH equipment to one end and all of the various bits of brake detail that I think I can get away with on my layout. There's a couple of small bits of pipe work that can be affixed to the chassis of the model just over the bogey. Once again, I will check to see if there's actually sufficient clearance for that to happen. It may be that they are for static display only. I've brought the model over to the spray booth. I'm just going to very quickly paint the wheels before we go much further. And then once I've painted the bogey frames, that can all be clipped back together. And we can do a general pass of grime all over the underframe. You can see I've also masked up the chassis and the electronics, we don't need to get any paint up there. It shouldn't harm the operation of the model, but as this does have visible engine room detail behind the body side windows, I'd rather uh, make sure that that didn't get any dirt on it. I've put a small bit of blue tack underneath each axle just to hold them into the bogey frames while we're working on the model uh, with the plastic uh, frame removed. I'll take a couple more coats of paint. I'm using Rail Match Sleeper Grime to paint those. And I'll also uh, see if I can focus a little bit of dirt on the copper strips as well for the uh, bogies. Just helps uh, sort of mask those up a little bit. It's worth pointing out on the new model, some attempt has been made to paint these black so they're not as visible as how they used to be on the old model. But there is still a little bit they've missed there. So I'll do my best to catch that with the airbrush. So I've put the model to one side uh, to let those wheels dry. So now I've got the bogey frames, we're just going to paint those in some rail match frame dirt. I'll be using the enamel paints for the whole of this project. I like using the enamel paints with regards to weathering and repainting. You get a lovely finish and it's nice and durable, long lasting. So make sure you use something like a spray booth here to extract all of those nasty fumes. I always prefer to detach the bogey frames if possible and paint them like this. You can move them around much more easily and make sure you've got good coverage underneath at the ends and down the sides. I'll be avoiding the uh, trough in the middle where the gear train goes but uh, for the most part we should be able to get a nice good coat of paint over all of that and it's just a little bit easier than if it's attached to the model.
So everything is now dried. And I've just brought the model back over to the bench. And of course, there'll be a little bit of overspray on the running surface of those wheels and also on the insides of the wheel where the uh, pickups run. So I've just taken a little bit of the airbrush finners and a cotton bud and just carefully run around each wheel in turn removing any excess overspray. But spraying it in that manner there really isn't too much to worry about just give it a light clean before you put the bogies back on. You can see we've got a nice finish there thanks to the airbrushing and I've also taken the time to just spray those pickup wipers a little bit further so they're not so easy to see when looking side on at the locomotive. I've fitted all of the various hoses and ETH equipment at the front of the loco. So obviously you can see I've removed the coupling. I've also removed that dovetail socket for the NEM coupler on the bogey so you don't see that either. So that's a nice little touch that that's now removable. Something else that I also like to do on rolling stock and locomotives alike is just add a blob of silver paint to the buffer shanks and it just makes things look a little bit more authentic. It's a nice touch that you don't usually get from the manufacturer. So with that completed, it's now time to add a general layer of grime and filth to the rest of the chassis. I'll be adding a bit of brake dirt to the bogies and making sure that the filth that goes around the battery boxes and fuel tank in the middle of the locomotive is a little bit darker than the otherwise rather brown appearance we've got to the bogies. I always use real pictures of these things for inspiration and as you can see from a couple of these photographs these things do get quite dirty on the underframe with the bodies staying relatively clean at least during the time period that I model. I've added a blob of liquid masking fluid to the gauge on the fuel tank. These are always wiped clean by drivers and fitters so any pictures of 47s that you see there'll always be this uh, little section on the fuel tank this little blob and that's the fuel gauge so make sure that that stays visible we don't want to just paint straight over it i've mixed up some more frame dirt to get things going so we'll spray the buffer beams a little bit of a pass over the fuel tank of the battery boxes and the upper portion of the chassis and just blend everything in and then i'll add some black to that mix that i've still got in the airbrush and then apply that around the fuel tank and battery box area and get a few different tones going on for the chassis. I've now added some Humbrol gloss black to the mix which has darkened the shade considerably and now we'll paint that around the battery boxes and the fuel tank with a little bit spewing out onto the last wheel on the bogies. Not too much there, but a little bit. I've looked at lots of pictures of 47.8s in service during the late 80s, early 90s, and uh, that seems to be the general level of finish. The body's relatively clean, but underneath there's a lot of dirt and muck. Next thing to do is to apply some rail match brake dust. This is quite a light colour so it needs to be applied carefully. It can look a little bit strange if you go a little bit overboard with it, but it does look effective applied in the right amounts in the right places. So I'll be using the real pictures again as reference for applying this and once that's completed we'll give the whole thing a coat of matte varnish which will just seal that paint in there, protect it from handling and grease from my fingers and stuff in the future from picking up the model and moving it around. I've left the model for about two to three hours to cure. It's not fully dry yet, but it's dry enough to apply varnish without worrying about getting any runs in the paint. Unlikely as it is, because there's so many details. So I'll just give this a quick pass with Railmatch 407. That's the matte varnish. And that's just gonna seal all of this in place and protect that paint from any handling. Most of the time when you pick a locomotive up, you're gonna pick it up like that with your hands and grab the fuel tanks and with just regular paint, weathering powder, or whatever you've used, you might find over time that that starts to rub off, wear off, or uh, show sort of uh, blotchy marks from the oils and greases from your skin. So it's just good practice, if you can, to seal it with a varnish. I 
I've just removed the cab interior from one end so I can fit a driver. The cab interior is removed in the same way it was on the old model. There are some small location lugs on the side of the interior that click into the glazing for the cab. So just be careful removing it, but it's fairly straightforward. This is the interior from one of the older Class 47s, and you can see just how much of a difference there is between the two models with the new interior being a vast improvement over the old one. Looking from this angle, you can see the biggest improvement, and that is that they have put the cab floor much lower down, probably very close to, if not exactly the height it should be in real life. And that was always the biggest fault with the old cab interior. If you looked through the windows, you could see that the uh, plastic just went straight across between the uh, bottom of the windows. All the major controls are picked out, as is the uh, small switch panel, the hot plate, and the horn and such controls for the second man. Of course, there's all that detail on the bulkhead as well. So quite a nice little cab interior. While I'm here, I will pick out a couple of these with a little bit of extra paint using the prototype as reference. Just while I'm here, might as well do it. And I'm also gonna fit a driver. This is the driver from an old Class 47. I've removed it from that cab interior as that loco is currently a project and won't be seeing the layout for a few months yet. I always repainted these models as it's a quite a good model of a driver uh, but it was never particularly well picked out from the factory uh, with regards to painting so I've just repainted his blazer, his hat and his skin and uh, what I'll do next is paint on a white shirt and a tie and then you should look really good uh, when you look through the windscreens of the loco. Okay that looks quite a bit better. Figures of this size are always very difficult to paint, so just forget eyes and a spatial expression. I have tried it. It doesn't work. It looks very strange. So just, you know, do what you can in the scale. But I did manage to get away with painting a tie onto his shirt, so it should look quite good there through the windscreens of the Loco. I've picked out a couple of the controls in silver paint and just applied the relevant accents to the ends of the various handles. Nothing too crazy, but just sort of lifts the uh, interior a little bit and the same goes for the switch panel just a little bit of silver paint and a couple of little bits of black paint just to mark the switches themselves and with the cab interior now refitted you can see how much of a difference adding a driver makes to a loco So now it's time to weather the body shell. I'm gonna be using the Tamiya panel line washes. I quite often use these now when weathering various locos. You get a lovely effect, and a nice bit of ingrained dirt in all of the details. The 47.8 subclass didn't appear until the late 1980s, and some of them didn't come into service until about 1990. This particular one, 828, is one of the later ones, and you can tell because they have the long-range fuel tanks, the number obviously gives it away, and then you have things like the cutaway cabs here, where the uh, little valance that runs around the front of the cab was cut away at Crew Works as part of the modification work. This loco, 828, wasn't painted into intercity livery until 1990, and even then, the actual swallow in the intercity text was not present on the locomotive. It ran for a few months like that before finally getting the swallow and the intercity text added to the livery in 1991. So with my layout being set in the very late 80s into 1990, this locomotive would have been straight out of the workshops. So it's important to make it look relatively clean. Even if modeling a later period, 47 eighths were used on long distance passenger work and certainly during the more pleasant months of the year were kept looking quite presentable with a little bit of brake dust and dirt along the white at the bottom here and obviously the usual exhaust dirt and all the ingrained filth in the vents. But generally speaking, they were cleaner than most. A mixture of the black and the grey washes will be sufficient for what I need to do and I'll be focusing that over all parts of the model and then finally we do a very small bit of airbrushing but that's just to create a bit of exhaust dirt around the exhaust port in the roof. So I'll be making good use of both of the washes and then any bits that get a bit much or go places where I don't want them to or I just want to tone it down use a cotton bud and some enamel thinners just to tone the effects down. You can also use that to create some streaking effects where it looks like the rain has washed a bit of dirt down the side of the body.
So after applying all of those washes, I've given it a couple of hours just to dry. Now we're gonna go over that with the cotton bud and the thinner. Obviously, if you look around that door, it looks absolutely terrible. But the point is we've got the paint in the places it needs to be, and I can now wipe across the top surface and remove the excess, leaving behind some ingrained dirt in that door. I've also done the same to the roof, really gone to town on the roof. But once again, I'll go over it, wipe off any excess and make sure all of the dirt is ingrained in all of that detail without you know, ruining the uh, nice paint finish of the model itself. I've lost the bit of footage for removing the enamel wash, but you can see I've noticed just a little bit on the very corner of the uh, screen pillar just there, covering up the cant rail. So using a cotton bud soaked in a small amount of enamel thinner, it's very, very easy to just remove the panel line wash. So if you do get that on any bits of the locomotive that you don't want it to be on, you can see it's quite easy to remove and it also provides some nice rain washing effects depending on what you're going for. So I've worked hard on the model making sure to remove most of that panel line wash but you can see it's left behind some ingrained dirt in some of the details. As I say, this loco was very fresh in terms of its livery during the time the layout is set, so it is a relatively clean appearance. I've got a little bit of exhaust dirt to add, and I might add a couple of other effects, but for the moment I'm going to put it back onto the chassis and see how it looks. So with the body back on, all screwed down, everything looks good. I'm going to just uh, apply a little bit of exhaust dirt to the exhaust port and don't need to do too much, but uh, it is important to portray it as it's always present on a loco, even in clean condition. For that, I'll just be using some enamel jet black, nothing fancy, and we only need to uh, pass over this area very lightly just to create a small sort of plume of exhaust dirt around that exhaust port there. Something like that should do the trick, so I'll leave that to dry. So that pretty much completes the weathering process. I've added a couple of small details to the buffers since the last clip, and that's just to apply a very small blob of sort of metallic uh, gray paint uh, to the head of the buffers just there to represent the grease that you often see on the surface of those. As you can see, it's a subtle effect, but it's just a nice little touch to add. So hopefully you learned a thing or two or at least found that enjoyable. I really enjoy weathering locos. It's one of the uh, sort of uh, parts of the hobby that I, I really get into, really enjoy doing, as well as weathering all of the rolling stock as well. The buffer beam detail is a nice touch and certainly an improvement over the previous version of the Backman Class 47. It is a shame they don't come fitted with a driver anymore, but as you can see, if you take one of these apart, it is relatively straightforward to add a driver of your own. And as you can see with that chap sitting there, it certainly brings the locomotive to life. A nice feature is the removable NEM socket from the bogey. Uh, that's made the, uh, the buffer beam detail in the front of the locomotive just look that little bit more realistic. So uh, yeah, quite happy with the project. So I'll leave you with a few shots of this thing running on the layout and I'll be back in the next video continuing the weathering theme but we'll be turning our attention to freight rolling stock. I've got various items that are in various states downstairs, some completed, some not started, so we'll get stuck into those. Weathering uh, freight rolling stock is perhaps one of my most enjoyable uh, weathering projects. You can have a lot of fun, get really creative with those. With locos, I try and err on the side of caution, use photographs, and I don't tend to go for super dirty stuff as I'm trying to portray the late 80s, which was a uh, quite a good time actually uh, for British Rail. Things were going relatively well at that time. Once you get into the early 90s and onwards, things start to look a little bit more grimy again. As you've seen in previous videos, this loco is sound equipped. I'm still not entirely convinced by sound, but it is nice to have a play around with it and listen to all the different functions and noises. But certainly in my experience, once it's run around the room for a few laps, that drone doesn't half get annoying and I tend to still run models silently.